And welcome to my penance for having a couple of successful episodes. Today, I want to resume my little Ben's Music Career subseries, sometimes known as You Never Know When to Quit, Do You? To which I say, I actually finally got the message. Uh, this is the final chapter of this little subseries of mine. So with that, today we're going to, as much as you can at least, speed through the last 14 years or so as of my making this. And we're going to take a look at some abandoned projects, some one-offs, uh, Pavand, you know, the Archive's usual theme song, and of course my last and possibly final album, and in my opinion my least worst album, and what's on the box today, Minot from 2010. If I got anything out of Greetings from Elderbush Gulch, regardless of how it turned out, it was that I had no future as even a minor pop star, which was just as well. I'd spent the first two years of college perpetually dealing with the egos of all the other wannabe hotshots I went to class with, and at war with most of my teachers. Between the album and my day-to-day -day life, my lust for fame pretty well died. As such, I shifted my focus from would-be fame to behind the scenes, be it in production or as a sideman, whichever world would take me. My own music was now just a glorified hobby. Having said that, I still wanted a decent studio-recorded album to my name, so I started saving up for one last full-blown studio album to be made at some undetermined time. Well, if nothing else, I still had my adventurous-slash-pretentious streak intact, the main unrealized project from this time was tentatively called The Avant-Garde Files. As the name implies, it was going to be a series of mostly abrasive sound collages. My little quirk was that I wanted it to be done with only virtual instruments and other electronic noises, no so-called real instruments. But given that my collages were all pretty similar and were all clocking in at around one minute apiece, the project was, unsurprisingly, quickly dropped. Given the constant mispronunciation of my last name, I knew right out of the gate that I wanted the new album to be called, phonetically, Min Not. I added the silent K just to be a jerk. And yes, the title is half a reference to pronounced Leonard Skinnerd. Anyway, I'd since retreated back to my old cassette rig, plus some digital overdubs, but really now just to record demos. I guess I just wanted some kind of potential product to have out there with this one, you know, so it wouldn't seem like I'd gone dormant. Of the five songs here, two of them failed to make the final cut for what became Minot. I'll only touch on those two here. The other three will be covered in their final versions. One of a very long line of rather warped love songs I wrote between 06 and 09. I think I dropped this one because it sounded too much like something that would have gone on Greetings from Elderbush Gulch, which I was trying to avoid. You know I wasn't gonna give you my heart, but take it in. Yeah. 
If memory serves, this one was inspired by all the money and celeb-obsessed reality and tabloid TV shows that were going on at the time, and alas, still are. It seemed like these people could do anything they wanted, and still can, and so, of course, I was more than eager to take the piss out of it. And yes, that was a snipe at Amy Winehouse in the final verse. No, no, no. So hard to be important when you're sweating and cold. The guy interviewed me has to wear a blindfold, and I'd break this guy's neck for a glass of Bordeaux. Pathetic, pathetic. Another case of pathetic, pathetic. I mentioned back on Volume 3 that I absolutely hated the wigwag, uh, white guy with acoustic guitar movement, especially John Mayer and Jack Johnson, even though the movement was dying off by this point. This would have been a lot more effective three or four years earlier. Regardless, I still had enough venom left in my system to make a, rather mean-spirited, satirical EP. Of course, going to school and sharing stages with a metric ton of wigwags probably didn't hurt. Anyway, I adopted the alias James H. Tartan for this one. Damned if I remember what the H stood for, though. And posed as a hyperconformist, ultra crass, stereotypical wigwag. This was recorded in fits and starts between May and August of 07. Much to my chagrin, this got a lot more attention than Preludes. In retrospect, I don't know why I was so shocked by this. One thing I noticed about John Mayer was that he loved his major seventh and suspended chords. So I wrote a little artificially laid-back thing using almost exclusively major sevenths and sus chords. And of course, it being a John Mayer pastiche, I tried to be trite and deep at the same time. And I've looked in my mind, and there's nothing there. I don't care if anyone stops staring. You're through the window of my mind uh, uh, uh. La 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 Well, every good libido-driven wigwag needs to appear sensitive, so I wrote this willfully shallow, overly basic love song. I have no idea what's up with the sound quality on this one. I love you. I love you, baby. Love Jack Johnson always liked to play the role of the good-natured, laid-back, beach-bum, beach-party guy, so a pastiche-slash-parody of what I used to call his Sunshine and Birkenstocks songs was very much in order. This was the only track I bothered to give the full band treatment. Sunshine, sundown, it's gonna be a party tonight. I guess this is where James's mask slid off and revealed his true nature. It was bound to happen. Like You Turn Me On Like a Light Bulb four years earlier, 
This took off on some forgotten MP3 platform, MySpace perhaps, I don't remember. And like Lightbulb, I was too dumb to try and cash in on it. Oh well. I'm a genius, cause I told you so. Wisdom in pieces, off of 99 cents per down. Taste great, less villain. I'm a hanger on to come concerns like war and bombs and you. I graduated from the University of Colorado at Denver, or UCD, in May of 2008, right into the loving arms of the Great Recession. As such, instead of landing a job a little closer to my field, I wound up signing on to a local staging company, whereupon I was sent to most of the major venues in and around Denver and became a stage grunt. Nice use of a degree there, Benny boy. While I eventually spun off into hotel AV and mostly business as opposed to entertainment events, I spent that first year slinging gear for nearly every major artist that passed through town, the most bitter pill coming almost immediately in the summer of 2008, doing a 3 a.m. load-in for my old classmates, The Fray. Like any good American college student, I'd spent my junior and senior years developing a nice drinking habit, which got considerably worse after graduation. If there was any good side to it, I turned out to be a brooding poetry-writing drunk, which led to a bumper crop of songs, only a few of which I actually kept. Nonetheless, I somehow remained focused enough to keep my eye on the perceived prize of my next album. I guess in some perverse way, the heavens aligned for me in the summer of 2009. Out of nowhere, I was asked to be one of the opening acts for that year's Underground Music Showcase, Denver's answer to South by Southwest. I, of course, accepted, even though I hadn't played live outside of a school setting in over three years. But I'd been working crew both day and night setting up the short-lived Mile High Music Fest, which occurred on the same weekend and I was completely exhausted, unrehearsed, probably beer-buzzed, and proceeded to fall flat on my face in front of every rock journalist in the region. I couldn't remember any of my songs, new or old. Conversely, I'd saved up about $3,000. I felt like I had a good album's worth of songs among the mountains of demos I'd recorded over the last three years. It was time for redemption. In August of 2009, I decided it was time to finally cut Minot. If anything, Minot was my deciding factor in sobering up. For what it's worth, I had my last drink sometime over Labor Day weekend that year. I also decided that I wanted to split the difference in personnel between the small band on Greetings and the one-man band stuff prior to that. So I only brought in one other musician, drummer Zach Morris, who alas bore no resemblance whatsoever to the Saved by the Bell character. I have no idea whatever happened to him. Anyway, Zach was still a student at UCD, so we used the opportunity to lock ourselves away into one of the many, very tiny, rehearsal rooms on campus, whereupon we proceeded to woodshed 10 out of the 15 projected tracks for Minot over the span of a couple of weeks. One song was ultimately dropped. 
On September 26th and 27th of 2009, we went into Laskin Productions, a converted house-slash-recording studio with a 48-track console and the latest version of Pro Tools HD, in Littleton, Colorado, to lay down the pertinent tracks for the album. In fits and starts over the next nearly three months, I returned to Laskin many times to record the rest of, and mix and master, Minot. The remaining sessions were uneventful. By design. There was no real concept to Minot, it was just what I felt were my best songs, arranged in such a way that they would hopefully play well as a whole work, though in the end, Minot seemed like two mini-albums. As such, I half-jokingly divided the album like an LP or cassette, and named each so-called side Min and Not. Actually, about half of Minot was written prior to Greetings from Elderbush Gulch, but the songs were dropped either because they were underdeveloped or were what I deemed uncommercial. Dark to Light was started sometime in 05 on some morning where the sun seemed to be shining, by my perception, a little odd. At the time, the song was pretty dry and dull, so it was shelved. I brought it back for Preludes to Minot in 07, where I revised the lyrics a bit. Sometime after acquiring a Dean Electric 12-string guitar, which wound up informing a good chunk of this album, I dropped the key by a half step to accommodate the extra tension on a 12-string, and tweaked the lyrics again. This time, it stuck. In the end, it was kind of a merger between American and British folk rock. Well, the sun shines a little differently these days. Or should I say, hardly at all. And everything seems a little upside down. Things seem a little strange. Everything seems to turn around Can make it rearrange I reversed the classic girl feeling chained to her guy lyric for this one. Oddly enough, I didn't know initially what name I wanted to use for the addressee of the lyric. I just knew it needed to be monosyllabic. So soon after, it was just dumb luck that at the top of my then-regular heap of LPs on my floor was a horrible pressing of Kate Bush's The Kickin' Side. Hey, it worked. The extended My Sharona-esque instrumental break was added and expanded later on. Well, Kate, you're bringing me down. It's too little... Too late, but you know I just might take the day. Well, any other woman could make me wait. You'd like to see me crawl now, would you? Okay. The first of four, all rather eerie, instrumentals on the album, and the first of three stabs at minimalist classical composition on here. This one was started on the guitar, but later transferred to piano, where it finally took shape. I'm still trying to figure out what time signature this thing was supposed to be in.
another one written and rejected for greetings. Initially, this was just the three short verses with a mindless two-chord vamp between each one. Somewhere down the line, I came up with a heavily structured instrumental piece, which still felt more like a few stray ideas than an actual song. Remembering that the existing Purple Sky was of a similar tone, I added the lyrics between each main instrumental idea and the tune finally came together. I wound up overdubbing a second drum kit on parts of this one. The album's only, please cover my song, song. Having said that, I didn't put it on the album because I thought it had cover potential, but because I felt like I had a decent pop song, something I have very, very few of. Gonna sit in the dark till my feelings fade Until my heart has left its mark just let the night be So I can forget about you Yeah, let the night be Well, maybe I'll get some sleep Tonight The album's second instrumental, and the second bit of minimalist composition. I'm pretty sure I just discovered the Eastern double harmonic scale here and was just intent on using it. The song's subtitle was a bit of wordplay. Uh, you know, entrance, entrance, Eastern stuff, yeah, whatever. The instrumental Elderbush Saga was supposed to end with the burial at Elderbush Gulch back in 04, but the chord progression to this one just screamed Elderbush, so I brought the name back one last time. This was another one written in 05 for Greetings, but left off because I didn't want any full-length instrumental tunes on that album. I wound up jumping behind the drum kit for this song, I'd never played a full kit before, and it kinda showed. And so we begin the not half of the album. This one dates back to 04, but was rejected for greetings for two reasons. One, the music was incredibly dry and dull, and two, I really wanted to write a song about seeing something in someone that no one else could see. Of course, it came out a bit warped. It seemed to be more about falling prey than anything else. 
I brought this back for Preludes to Minot in 07, by which time I'd come to embrace the lyrics. I pretty much rewrote the music, though. The sound effects on this one mark the only released use of Bennytronics, which was just me making noise with a bunch of random guitar effects pedals, kind of a parody of Robert Fripp's Frippertronics. An edited version of this one was released as Minot's single at the time, to no avail. She's an angel in Latin. She's an angel in disguise. You can't stop staring into your deep dark eyes. But you look like the devil. But it feels like Two summers in a row, I'd lost some unrelated, much-loved elder neighbors of mine, which got me ruminating about death. This was effectively a jumble of thoughts about a potential hereafter and some of those uniquely quirky funeral traditions, pennies over the eyes being admittance to heaven and so on. We paid your admittance with the pennies on your eyes. It gets so thick and then we find that there is for the past five years, aspiring film composers ages 18 to 35 from around the United States have entered the Young Film Composers Competition. And the Turner Classic Movies Young Film Composers Competition, and by turn, silent film music, rears its ugly head one last time. By 2009, the competition had ceased to exist, which was just as well. It had gotten a little bleak. One of the past winners committed suicide in 05, and there just seemed to be a real cloud hanging over it after that. Anyway, I still wrote little pieces of music for the competition, but had long since stopped submitting them. It had also become a bit of a tradition to have my titles for these things become unintentionally cryptic. Uh, see Souls for Sale, Circus Fire Scene. While the 1927 film The Show was the movie du jour at one point, my little 56 second tune was unrelated to the film. The title was 100% pure intentional self-parody. And yes, this is the last of the three minimalist instrumentals. On the surface, this is a rather cranky, bruised relationship song, but it was really a metaphor for my increasingly sour experiences in music. It was basically my way of saying, Thank you, sir. May I have another? Well, I play the part of the broken heart, but you do the crying now. You want to rain? Go ahead, rain. Just don't make that this rose of blue again Let down the drain, going right down the drain But well, sometimes things are just better that way So go ahead and rain
I was kind of into dream analysis on and off for a few years. This one stemmed from a series of dreams I had in early 08. One about Warren Zevon, who died in 03, one about a lost love, and one about being chased by an angry mob and finding safety in an elevator. After each dream in real life, I woke up thinking, well, a lot of good that did me. Given that the arrangement to this one just keeps building and building to the point of absurdity, I decided to throw it right over the cliff for the song's final minute by throwing in my, to date only, backwards hidden message. Me reading a couple of excerpts from Ed Wood's pseudo-memoir, Hollywood Rat Race. And lastly, in case you were curious about the significance of the stuffed squirrel suite, since these three songs all segue into each other, and they're arguably the three most artsy-fartsy tunes on the album, and when playing live, I started regularly playing live again later in 09, I always played these tunes in one shot, I started referring to it as the Stuffed Squirrel Suite, just for a little pretentious humor. It was also a good way to kill ten minutes on stage. And a lot of good did me All these things that I feel A lot of good did me Though I know it's not to see. I've spent many hours pondering those actors who hate Hollywood. The New York stage, they shout. That's the only place for an actor or actress. That's the only place to really act. They shout at the top of their lungs to all who will listen, and their shouting is so loud that those of us who don't care to listen have our hearing devices infiltrated anyway. We cannot ignore them. Yet, I don't even care to ignore them. I want to know these haters. Even though I was never terribly happy working local crew, I built up a few good war stories. This song was intended as a Chuck Berry-styled barrage of imagery, and everything mentioned in the lyrics had some degree of truth to it. I really did get nearly impaled by Madonna's couch. I really did watch Grateful Dead drummer Mickey Hart's drum kit fly right off a loading dock, and got nearly clocked by runaway rigging motors more times than I care to admit. On a related note, as a joke, I thanked all the artists I'd worked for in the liner notes for inadvertently funding my little album. She had 37 costumes, only 15 songs. Had no idea a dress could be that long. She had a couch, it was purple with gold trim I almost impaled myself, trying to carry it in Got a wrench in my pocket and in my place I can't let down 20,000 screaming fans No, this job's not such a sin Just winging two tons But it just missed me by an inch Well, I never signed up for this I only wanted to see the show Ending the album on an unintentionally, mildly jazzy note, one based around my electric 12-string, no less, I'd started writing a hopelessly romantic lyric about some lovelorn guy wandering around a beach, realized how silly it sounded, and warped it into a tune about some love-happy dork wandering on the beach during a storm. To bring the not half of the album full circle, I reprised the Benny Tronics from Angel in Black over the storm noises that close this track. Oh yeah, and I wound up taking drum duties on this one too, playing something of an unintentional samba. My heart's melted again Cold sand run through my veins My heart 
and my arms are trying to miss me. Yeah. By this point, I'd long since settled on the bad amateur photography motif for my album covers, because I can't draw or paint to save my life. Having said that, I don't really remember where the scrapbook idea came from for this one, and yes, it was assembled on real scrapbooking paper. My guess is I didn't want my cover to just be some stray Polaroid shot. And speaking of Polaroid, by the time I took this pick, Polaroid film had been discontinued, and I'm pretty sure the last of the old stock had recently expired. So I wound up taking the shot digitally, went to Walmart and got a couple prints of it made, left it out for a bit to accrue some dust, and then digitally inserted it into an old Polaroid frame. Oddly enough, the actual old Preludes cover. As for the photos, both this and the cover to Preludes to Minot were taken from the vantage point of my parents' back porch, incidentally the same vantage point that inspired the song These Memories back on Greetings from Elderbush Gulch. Anyway, I believe the Minot pick was shot around Halloween of 2008. The sky has that uniquely purple tint to it that tends to happen in Colorado at dusk in autumn fit with the song Purple Sky, I guess. The text was done on my dad's old hand-me-down typewriter, which has since been used for archive. And yes, the back of the booklet was intended as a joke. I borderline literally bankrupted myself making Minot. After writing the check for the last recording session, I was down to my last three dollars and change. I had to live on a credit card for a couple of months. Anyway, as such, I couldn't afford to release the album. It took until June of 2010 for me to put aside about $300 to get 50 copies of the album made and send it out to anyone that I thought might give the album a little ink or airplay. I wasn't expecting the album to get any real traction, and I was right. The only two things to come out of it were a surprisingly positive review from the Colorado Music Buzz that October, and I later learned that legendary East Orange, New Jersey-based freeform radio station WFMU spun The Wire at about 4.30 on some obscure Sunday morning. The album only started selling a little after Oddity Archive got established, and as of my making this, I still have a few of the original 50 copies kicking around. And in case you're curious, I dropped about $3,300 into the making of this album. It was a kamikaze mission if there ever was one. To my utter amazement, especially after my disastrous performance at the Underground Music Showcase, the phone started periodically ringing for me to perform the odd gigs starting in the summer of 09, and despite not having a band, occasionally playing the odd rock club, which I much preferred to the coffee houses. I always seemed to play better to a rock crowd. While I started putting on much better shows, I never was able to build a following. After playing to a literally empty room in July of 2011, I decided to hang up my guitar. Minot was supposed to be a new beginning, not my swan song. Indeed, I had two projects in the works as of 2011, which of course were abandoned. 
One was another rock album, tentatively called Available Space, inspired by those signs you see in empty lots and vacant strip malls. This album was to be mostly recorded at home, with the drums being recorded remotely by session musicians. Any real keyboards, like a real piano, would have still had to have been done in a studio. The other abandoned project was called Silence is Golden, see Volume 1. Since the original 2001 Silence is Golden had never been released, I figured it was time to finally follow through with the originally intended silent film concept. This time, it was to be an all-acoustic, all-instrumental, and homemade mix of period covers, uh, mostly from sheet music I'd collected featuring silent film stars on the artwork. And aside from that, there would have been a few original, would-be movie, not necessarily theme songs, and at least a partial score to Buster Keaton's 1922 short, Cops. Not a single note of either project ever got recorded. Sort of. Well, I don't think I'm going to get away with dodging the Archive's theme song, so here goes. When I started making Oddity Archive in mid-2012, the theme song was XTC's 1982 rock radio hit, Senses Working Overtime. Not wanting to deal with any copyright issues, I dropped it after the fourth episode. Problem was, the ideas just weren't popping. So I sifted through my backstock of unrecorded material for any short, hopefully reasonably catchy thing that might work. I pulled an unfinished piece, written on ukulele of all things, called The Kind of Girl Your Mother Must Have Been, which was originally to tie in with a scene in Harold Lloyd's 1925 film The Freshman. This became the middle section of my little theme song to be. Realizing it sounded like a middle section, I needed an ideally extra short and simple framework to hang it on, which is where I, on the fly, barfed out those four now famous notes on my mandolin. The recording took place over a single afternoon. I remember I found that the more stuff I added to it, probably because it was such a threadbare tune, the better it sounded. So after considerable aural sweetening, I finally had my theme tune. Upon listening back, it sounded to me like a pavan, which is a Renaissance-era, sedate, processional dance music. Smartass that I am, I figured having written something like that in the 21st century, it better be in the past tense. Hence, Pavand. Now, I've been asked many times over the last several years, do I ever plan on making and releasing another album? And my stock response has become, maybe. And so the most likely thing you'd see out of me at this point, I think, would be some kind of Oddity Archive soundtrack album. I mean, I have been trying to do some new incidental music for this show for about a year and a half now. But a few of those tracks have been released as digital singles, so... Uh, as far as an album goes, it hinges on A, do I have an album's worth of material, and B, do I think I have a solid album's worth of material. Now, as far as another more standard rock-pop singer-songwriter kind of album, if the time, money, and inspiration ever allow, I might, but honestly, it's just not a priority. Now, uh, before I wrap things up here, there's actually one point that I've been sitting on since uh, certainly Volume 2, if not since the beginning, 
And that's because I wanted to save it for those of you that have stuck through this little sub-series of mine right to the bitter end, all four of you. And that is that there's actually a moral to my story. And that moral would be, with regards to any kind of creative endeavor, just fucking do it. And I'm not going to censor that F-bomb there. I think I earned that one. So my attitude is make that record, uh, make that movie, paint that painting. You don't have to release it. But if you do, and I kind of recommend that you do, no matter how much you suck, no matter how many slings and arrows you take for it, it's still, and I can say this from both personal experience and from friends, that it's a hell of a lot better than not knowing what might have been, because that is what will eat away at you for the rest of your life. It's so weird having a moral to Oddity Archive. I think I'm getting soft in my old age. Anyway, that's it for today's archive. You can breathe a sigh of relief now.